The last time that Dr. Walid Faraz spoke here, it was an exceedingly dangerous event some three and a half years ago because it was one of the worst winter blizzards that Washington had ever seen. And that he was able to make it here alive, <laughs> soldier on through this terrible storm, and there were some brave Westminsters in the audience, and that everyone got home alive, though it took hours. Uh, was very laudable. So we've given him a break before asking him back and guaranteed better weather, which I'm, I'm delighted we have tonight. <clears throat> now, as you all know, I think Dr. Walid Fares was a foreign policy advisor to two presidential candidates, one of whom you may have heard of, Donald Trump, the other one, uh, Mitt Romney. He's also renowned as a Fox News expert on the Middle East and appears often on there. I didn't, needn't tell you. He's also clairvoyant, as he was the only person to predict a year before it happened the Arab Spring, uh, which he did in his book, The Coming Revolution, The Struggle for Freedom in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Fares has a PhD in International Relations and Strategic Studies from the University of Miami, political science degree from Saint Joseph in Beirut, I presume, and uh, a law degree from the Lebanese University of Beirut and a master's in international law from the Université Jean Moulin in Lyon. Now he's taught political science uh, and Middle Eastern Studies in Florida for many years at the Atlantic University. And he's also taught here uh, global jihadi strategies <coughs> at the National Defense University, where I was occasionally privileged to sit in on and learn from his superb classes. Dr. Fares wrote six books uh, as a resident of the Middle East in Arabic, and another five when he came stateside in the United States where he immigrated in uh, 1990, legally. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst those book titles, I told you one, the other, War of Ideas, uh, The Confrontation, uh, The Coming, well, we already mentioned The Coming Revolution. Uh, as it won't, you won't be surprised to hear as uh, Dr. Fares is a native of Beirut that he speaks fluent uh, Arabic and French. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fares on the subject of US strategy in the Middle East till 2020. Will it work? Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate the fact that I'm going to be meeting with some of my good friends in the audience, including current and former faculty at National Defense University, people who worked in the agencies, all the agencies in defense, but also good citizens who have done great achievements. I've been here, as uh, Bob mentioned, a few years ago um, through very difficult conditions, uh, <laughs> blizzard, but I made it, and there were some heroes here, so we, we survived it. Uh, but here again, I'm coming back, and I would like to thank, first of all, formally Dr. Riley for not just inviting me, but inviting you and um, being really the center of this wonderful project, which is the Westminster Institute. I know the previous leadership, and this leadership is doing uh, great and will do greater. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you tonight, uh, especially uh, after you know, many years where we didn't engage, uh, and many things have happened. Um, I want to go ahead and start without longer introductions because there is so much to cover. So the only matter you should be aware of is that you've got to stop me in 45 minutes and my good <laughs> assistant, Brooke, has this mission of stopping me. I know there is a clock in the back because of the volume of matters that are, have been happening and are happening. So 
The good Dr. Riley asked me if I can comment about United States policy in general and strategies in particular between now and 2020. Actually, when he asked me to lecture, we were still in 2018. <laughs> so now we're in 2019, and many things have happened since last December and now. And we are living in strange, very fast times. Mm -hmm. You agree with me? I mean, the events are like a express acela train, yes. very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time you want to think about this one event that happened in your life or in the life of the nation, then you are already in the second event and the third event. And I am known, modestly, that my work, my specialty, is to project the future events. So you can imagine how difficult that is. <laughs> While you are like an Acela train going very fast, and then you're going to think faster than the events, that, that's a challenge. But this is something I love. This is something I've been doing modestly and focusing on. I don't opine, like many talking heads in TV, on everything. I give my opinion on the things I'm specializing about or in or regarding subjects that uh, I have been following for the last, I don't want to scare you, but 30 years, when I was two or four. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I am, I am, and that's legally, since my good professor colleague mentioned, I am a 29-year-old American. <laughs> If I emigrated in 1990, that would be my age. So forget about the past. That, yes, I'll show you all the papers I have. So ladies and gentlemen, let's go for it. Um, the question is, between now and 2020, are the strategies of the US dealing with the greater Middle East going to be successful or not? It's already difficult to address this issue because of the speed. I mean, any strategy we think about today by the time we're going to apply it, it will be September. You know, the debates, the Congress, we are a divided city, we are a divided everything. It's so different from the past. Uh, we, can't, we can barely have a national security policy that we have an agreement about, let alone apply it. And the region is changing. There were times in history where the region was, I don't want to say stable, but static. I mean, we would talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict forever. 1947, 48, and about 1992, with Madrid conference, nothing really changed. Couple wars. <laughs> they changed a little bit of the real estate, but it was the same. And it was, I don't want to say funny, but it was you know, ironic at the time, and I was living in, in the region till 1990, that when I came to the States in 1990, I was prepared for something, I prepared myself for something, and then I found something else. Mm -hmm. When CNN would flash Middle East crisis, I, would th I was living in Miami at the time, which was my first stage before emigrating to the United States. This is just a joke. <laughs> Take it as a joke, even if it's videotape. <laughs> it's I enjoyed Miami before I really came to Washington. <laughs> Uh, Middle East crisis to me was, okay, we're going to talk about the Kurds, the Iranian threat, the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, Egypt's uh, Copts. Uh, you know, there were many things happening. It was only, in the view of CNN, the Israelis and the Palestinians. That was the only thing in the Middle East that was happening. Until the Arab Spring, until 9-11, then the American public, then the international community said, wait a minute, there are other conflicts happening in the Middle East. And the Arab-Israeli, Palestinian-Israeli conflict is one of them, one of maybe eight, nine. But that was the view of academia and media in the United States. So as I am going to be traveling with you through the region and back and forth to the White House, to Foggy Bottom, to the DOD, and look at the various approaches to these conflicts, the difficulty is that the American public was not given the opportunity, certainly, certainly before the Arab Spring, absolutely before 9-11, God knows, during the Cold War, to understand the players in the Middle East. So when I came here in 1990, I was doing my PhD at the same time teaching in Florida. And <coughs> let me illustrate with two examples very quickly. Let's say one example to make it faster. I was assigned a class in Middle Eastern Studies undergrad at Florida International University. It was my first class. I was excited. 
enter the classroom and I ask a question which I assume would be very simple, we'll build on it. And I asked, can anybody tell me where is the Middle East? A young man with a hat like this <laughs> said, I know, sir, it's the other side of the Middle West. <laughs> Oh boy, I knew I had a job for a long period of time. All right, I'll tell the second story, which is linked to it. Then a girl, a student, female student, stood up and said, no, no, sir. She was laughing at the guy. said, she was a girl, so slightly more intelligent. And then she was Jewish American, so she knew at least part of the Middle East. She said, no, it is Israel with some Arab neighborhoods around. <laughs> That was better. <laughs> we were making progress. OK. So we did have, and I, I lived it, but of course it's now known. Many people who are in the Middle East field, Middle East studies field, understand that during the 90s, all the way till 9-11, we had a bigger problem, which is our public. We had little information about the Middle East. I'm not talking about people like yourselves. You already know that's why you're here. But I'm saying the general public had little knowledge. And it's not the responsibility of the public. It's the responsibility of the classroom, of academia. And I argued in many of my writings, including in a couple of my books, one of which was mentioned, The War of Ideas, that if you have a problem in the classroom, in any, uh, in any field, but specifically in Middle Eastern studies, guess what's going to happen? If you disinform or misinform the classroom, this classroom is going to produce graduates. Those graduates are going to go somewhere, get jobs. So from the classroom, those graduates are going to end up in the newsroom. So whatever you are misinformed about by your professors and teachers and whatever academic achievements, books and others, it's going to follow them to the desks, to the news desks. And they're going to ask questions as incredible as this young man I met when I was teaching in Florida for the first time. But he is, was a beginner. Oh, by the way, you know, 10 years later, exactly, I met this young man in the halls of Congress. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm in a committee. I can't tell you which one. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, but he had been transformed. He, he got the right education. Obviously, he got to that committee. So the reason I make, I'm, I'm offering this introduction is because it is not easy to engage in the world of ideas. It's not easy to engage even in analysis if you have different levels of understanding of what we're talking about. And that's the matter that I have been encountering and experiencing for the last couple of decades, specifically since 9-11. You know, when you go on TV, for example, it's a big responsibility because you're looking at the camera and you know that there are millions of people on the other side. And whatever you're going to say with the minimum amount of time you are given, because I'm not a talking point. I don't have an hour. You have three or four minutes and you're going to serve. You know, you, you go on TV and you know that. So what is it that you could put in those three four minutes on the one hand to tell the truth, to be factual, especially about the Middle East? And also to educate the public on the other side. It's really a challenge. I may write a chapter in the next book about my engagement with the media dealing with the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So the second point leading us to the strategies is the fact that these strategies have changed. We're not talking about a strategy as during the time of the Soviet Union. It would be 20 years long, five, six. Our strategies regarding the Middle East in America change with, of course, this is our system with the presidency. So every four years, every eight years, and even the eight years, every mid-term uh, elections and every other mid-term elections, you know it. So we change. Our policies change. We have change of majority in Congress. You know, I'm not lecturing on things you, you know already, but take it into consideration. Just think of. Bush the first in the war in Iraq. Then think of the eight years of Clinton. In terms of foreign policy, I'm not, I am not a domestic policy guy. So I'm looking at foreign policy. Then you have 9-11. And then you're going to have the, uh, the Bush second tenure of eight years. And then Obama for eight years. 
and then the, the mini two years of the Trump administration. So those leaps, if you add them to the changes in the Middle East, then you see how challenging it is to opine on what would be our US strategies in the Middle East by 2020. And it was given the task by 2020. We will be in the middle of a presidential campaign slash election. The Middle East also has changed. Now, I know you have had wonderful speakers here. I, I've seen the list, topics, watched a few of these videos. So let me try to summarize very quickly the longest period of time possible so we could get to what I call the post 9-11 or post Arab Spring uh, period. Now, the Middle East was not the Middle East some 100 years ago, right? We are in 2019. 100 years ago in 2019, they were constructing the new Middle East. So a few years before, you had France and Britain agreeing on Sykes-Picot agreement. It created the Middle East. Before that, there was the Ottoman Empire for the previous 420 years. So we are still the quarter, 100 years is the quarter of the life of one empire. So the legacy of these uh, aging empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Mameluk Empire, the Abbasid, that could go on for another 1,300 years. That still has a weight on the culture, the perception, the ideologies, of the populations and of their elites. It's easier to talk about the history of the United States, of Australia, of Canada, and of the entire Southern Hemisphere because it's shorter. When you talk about the Middle East, you go back in time for long you know, centuries, and of course to some even thousands of years. I will take the centuries. It's still long. And what, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that even if we engage in Iraq, or in Syria now, or the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict, or the internal situation in these countries. It is not only about our foreign policy. So we cannot go to the White House or Congress and say, what have you done? You did not bring peace to the Middle East. You did not do the change. We, are, we barely count in this. There are long histories, long conflicts, long uh, tensions, and at the same time, a very quick evolution. It's all happening at the same time. So what has impacted the region was the previous empire before the formation of the new Middle East. That's the Ottoman Empire. It was a caliphate, and I'm sure all of you here in this room know what's a caliphate. So when the Ottomans collapsed, you had two forces in the region. One force that wanted to go back to the status quo ante, meaning to the Ottoman Empire, to the caliphate. Ottoman or Arab, doesn't matter. Those are known as the Islamic fundamentalists. That's the easier way. I would call them the Islamists. Technically speaking, we had two streams of these Islamists after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Those who are from Sunni background and those who are from Shia background. Those who are from Sunni background Sunni, S-U-N-N-I, those rose, and they wanted one thing since the 1920s. One, uno, the return to the caliphate. Yeah. Mr. Osama bin Laden told us this matter after 9-11. Mm -hmm. He said, we had headaches, <laughs> generations of Islamists really since the collapse of the Sultanate wanted to bring it back. So it's as simple as that. Everything the Islamists, Salafists, Jihadists, all the crowd that you have been lectured about, informed about, want one thing, go back to the caliphate. That explains a history of 80 years of diverse Salafists and, 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 and Jihadists, at the core of which, may I say, and I know there are many experts here, the Muslim Brotherhood were the nucleus, the core out of Egypt, Hassan al-Banna, and the rest as you know it. So the Muslim Brotherhood was the essential core of the Islamist, mostly Sunni, network, which evolved offshoots of offshoots. I want to go very quickly here, leading to many jihadi organizations. And at one point, al-Qaeda rose out of that. At a second point, ISIS rose out of that. 
And in a few years from now, maybe already soon to be, a post-Al-Qaeda, post-ISIS. It is the ideology that has been moving the, the, the political forces that identify themselves as Islamists. All right, so ha now we have one stream. The second stream is the other side, the Shia side. And these were known as the Khomeinists, the followers of Ayatollah Khomeini out of Iran, 1979. All right, out of which came the Ayatollah regime, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Nujaba in Iraq, so on and so forth. So let's close the historical background by saying, out of the old Middle East, we have two streams. One is jihadi, Salafi, Brotherhoodi, whatever you want to call it. The other one is Iran, regime, Khomeini, Hezbollah, etc. What the second stream wanted and continued to want is to establish something similar to the caliphate. They call it imamate from imam, an imamate. So it's a Shi Shia caliphate at the end of the day. You know. Now, on the other hand, you have everybody else. Dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, Arab nationalists, Ba'athists. These are the ruling dominant forces from the 1920s till recently. And then next to them, civil society, left wing, liberal, etc. And on the very side, weaker elements, weaker communities in the Middle East who are the minorities, starting from the larger minorities, the Kurds, Southern Sudan, Nubians, Christians in the Middle East, Assyrians, Maronites, Copts, so on and so forth. So that is basically the big picture of who are the players. Now, crossing the Mediterranean and the Atlantic back to the west, we had to deal from the time we didn't have a US foreign policy in the Middle East to the time we started to have one. I'm talking about the United States. We started to have one in 19, as of 1945, practically. Of course, we had ambassadors and consuls and et cetera. But from 1945, we found ourselves. It's nice for an immigrant to say we found ourselves, because <laughs> Americans, obviously. That's your evidence. <laughs> in North Africa. And the British were already in, in, in the Levant, and the French in the Levant, and they left. And then we expanded as the United States. And obviously, at the end of World War II, we had the Cold War, whatever the Soviets were, we were to stop them. That's how we found ourselves with the Shah of Iran against Nasser. You see how fast I'm trying to go to get to the point? Because I can't leave anybody behind to, we're going to explain it. So to get to the point here, we had a pretty stable policy as US during the Cold War. If the Islamists and the jihadists were struggling to get the caliphate back, what did we want, what, what were we doing to bring the Soviet Union down? So that was pretty clear. All our agencies, our think tanks, our governments, our congresses were focusing on the Cold War, making sure that we contain on the one hand, and then if you can win that war by bringing the Soviet Union down. The Soviet Union collapsed by itself. That's a big debate that I'm not going to go into because of economics and others. So from the moment the Soviet Union collapsed, the Middle East started to go in different directions. As long as there was a Cold War, Soviets, United States, our clients, their clients, and we clashed. Sometimes hot wars, such as the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Yemen conflict or others, and most of the time, Cold War. One interesting point I will make during the Cold War, which is a feature, was a feature of US policy and Western policies, was because the Soviets were the priority to us, because their missiles were aimed at us, our missiles were aimed at them. So that, that's a priority. We had to engage in alliances that were very counterproductive, but we had to do it. So I'm not a historian tonight. But I'm just reporting that we, the United States and NATO, the allies, we were in many instances the allies of whom of the Islamic fundamentalists against the Soviets. Our national security advisors, Benyu Brzezinski, was encouraging the Afghan jihadists, called Mujahideen at the time, to fight the Soviets with everything they've got. And he told, him, he told them, fight them with jihad. He used the term jihad. That was our national security advisor. It's in my book. So we got out of the Cold War. And now we started to be surprised by events. First of all, 
the jihadist movement, which was, I don't want to say with us, but the Islamists in general were, were with us against the Soviets, now we're on, on, on their own and we're targeting us. Because each one of these big players has a logic of its own. So the Soviets were down. Now the jihadists and the Islamists and the Iranian regime, all of them looked at the United States as the major problem they confront. Because they wanted to establish a caliphate. They wanted to establish an imamate. And who is blocking them? Either us or our allies. Hence the rise of al-Qaeda throughout the 90s starting to strike at the homeland, including in New York in 1993, declaration of war in 1996, second declaration of war in 1998, strikes against our embassies in East Africa in, 19, in August of 1998, attempt over the Pacific against airliners, it was foiled, attack in Yemen, and then they visited us on 9-11. That prompted the United States to move into the Middle East and engage in Afghanistan and in Iraq, which we can debate till tomorrow. We don't have that time. So we finally found ourselves in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and elsewhere in the region. That decade from 2001 till 2011, a full decade, this is the first question I would like to address quickly preparing ourselves for our current strategies. What were our strategies as US? What were our strategies? We fought the Taliban in Afghanistan. And we have to be very frank and honest in any discussion, because now we are 19 years after that. So we defeated the Taliban. We removed the regime, no doubt about it. It took us, what, 45, years, 45 days. That's the power of the United States. It can administer a massive change somewhere between 30 to 45 days. We brought down Saddam Hussein in about a month and a few days with a million, with a million soldiers' army. Mm -hmm. We brought the Taliban who were terrifying everybody. So army to army, there is no one on planet Earth that can defeat us. But it is what happened afterwards that counts. So we defeat the Taliban in 45 days, and we are fighting them for the following 19 years. Problem. French would say, il y a un problème. And there is a problem. <laughs> C'est un problème. Exactement. Same thing in Iraq. In Iraq, we defeated Saddam. Then we had to fight Al-Qaeda Iraq. Then we defeated Al-Qaeda Iraq. Then we did something, which is to withdraw from Iraq in 2011, uh, end of 2011. And the minute we withdrew from Iraq without preparing, who is going to be after us in charge of Iraq? That's the crux. That's it. Then what's going to happen is all the forces which we were fighting are going to come back. Mm -hmm. Hence, we had ISIS. Mm -hmm. Then we had the Iranian militias moving into Iraq. It's not that they defeated us. We withdrew. So if we withdraw and it won't leave behind us a force that is our ally, that is capable, that is accepted by the population, this is what we're going to get. And this is the parameter I'm advancing for any future decision we're going to make in the Middle East. I was um, on Fox Business Channel with Lou Dobbs the other day. And Lou was furious about what we're doing in Afghanistan. Yeah. And it, as if the world, it, it, he's a good friend, as if the world is divided in two. One, we stay forever doing the same thing. We fight the Taliban, they fight us, and nothing actually happened. Or we are furious, we pack and leave, and the Taliban are going to come. Do you have any shred of, of, of imagination that tells you if we withdraw tomorrow for, from, from Afghanistan, what is going to happen? The Taliban are going to seize probably about 80%. And the, the, the ex-Northern Alliance will go back to where they are. And then an international jihadi group will emerge from Afghanistan. If we withdraw from eastern Syria, I'm just serve the whole dinner in one shot. If we withdraw from eastern Syria without preparing our allies to take over, what is going to happen? In Syria, it's even more <coughs> complex. You're going to have the Iranian militia rushing in. 
you're going to have the Assad regime rushing in, although it's limping, but they will rush in. You're going to have the Turkish-backed Muslim Brotherhood militias rushing from the north. And everybody is going to assault the Kurds. It's going to be a terrible war, another terrible war. And it's going to be a Syria divided like Poland for many, many decades. So I'm concluding on the method of our strategies. Defeating the enemy is not the problem. It's the replacement of that enemy that has been the problem. So it's a question, as the 9-11 Commission said many years ago, of not just imagination, but of education and of engagement with the forces on the ground. So the list is simple. We have Syria. We have Iraq. We have Yemen. We have Libya. These are four active wars. So what's the situation in those four wars, in those four battlefields? In Libya, let's begin with the simplest one in my view. In Libya, after Gaddafi, you have the West and the East. The West is governed by a government, which is on the one hand recognized by the United Nations, on the other hand sitting in a building on the seventh floor, and all the other floors are occupied by the Islamist militias. <laughs> so the UN, the UN recognizes the seventh floor. Of course, I'm putting it in, in a comical way. I don't know if it's the seventh floor, but when we speak with their officials, everything is great. We're recognized by the United Nations, and we are the legitimate rulers of, of Libya. But then you go down, literally speaking this time, to the street in front of that building, the prime minister's building. It's ruled by Muslim Brotherhood, jihadi, all kind of Islamist cocktails that exist. And they rule that part of Libya, backed by Qatar, backed by Turkey. It's not even a secret. You don't need me to come and mention it. It's online. On the other side of Libya, now about 75, 76% of Libya is ruled by an organization of former militaries and new militaries known as the Libya National Army, which is under the command of Field Marshal Haftar. I know the title is always impressive. Reality is he's fighting the jihadists. He has pushed them all the way to Tripoli. The problem is he's not recognized by the United Nations. Egypt supports him. UAE supports him. Maybe Saudi Arabia supports him. France, La France supports him. Russia is trying to move in. But Russia asked him if he wants full support like Assad. He said, no, but America is not looking towards me. I mean, we have no relation. That's what he says. So now this is Libya. And in the next few weeks and months, we will have, as Americans, to make a decision, to have a decision regarding Libya. Who are we with? On which side? We are divided. I can assure you that through the Congress and through uh, the halls of the administration, we are divided either between let's choose the UN, let's choose Haftar, or let them fight, fight it among themselves. That's Libya. I'll be happy to take questions a few minutes later. Yemen, getting more complicated. Yemen, you have the north of Yemen is controlled by the Houthis, not the Houthi, the Houthi militia, confused with other militias in Africa. The Houthis are basically mostly Shia, they're Shia, and they're backed by Iran, controlled by a Hezbollah-like organization, Jundullah. So the Houthis <laughs> control from the Saudi border all the way to the capital that they have seized. They have pushed all the way. It's like North and South Korea, almost. They pushed all the way to Aden, to the south, and then they were pushed back all the way somewhere south of the capital. So you have the north is pro-Iran. The south is two south. You have the central south, which is ruled by the president of Yemen, Hadi, who's backed by Saudi, and who's backed by, let's say, the United States international community. But they have a little problem. I'm going to say it on video. Within the government of Mr. Hadi, you have a significant component of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is something that the public doesn't know much about in America. That's why I'm having a hard time on Twitter to explain what it is. Islah. The Islah party, called Reform Party, is Muslim Brotherhood backed by Qatar. So the Central South has good guys, but it, with them, you have the Brotherhood, 
The very south, the south-south, the, the is actually the old southern Yemen, which in the past was backed by the Soviet Union, which now, of course, have, they have abandoned Marxism, but you know they, are, they want to go back to the old days. They want to form their republic again. They're gonna, they want to secede. Now, these guys are anti-Islamists, are anti-Khomeini, uh, Shia, uh, Houthis, but they are only backed by the UAE. I know I'm making your lives complicated tonight, but I want to do it. <laughs> so th this is a piano in Yemen. So the question now, and I don't want to give an advice here to the government, to our administration, but the question is, what, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to be with the Houthis in the north? Of course not. We are putting the toughest sanctions on Iran. Then we're going to go to the, sh the, the Houthis and tell them, you know, you're our friends. It's impossible. So we are recognizing the center, the center center. That would be President Hadi and, and his allies. President Hadi is OK, but that he has a problem with him, those brotherhood. And those brotherhood are a problem because they are going to be establishing an Islamist state. <coughs> They're going to repeat the experience of Libya and of Egypt. Then you have this, the very south. The very south, South Yemen, capital Aden, has no relations with the United States. It's almost like Libya. So we have to make those difficult choices. And we don't have strategies at this point in time unless I am not informed. And believe me, I am informed. Moving quickly to Iraq and Syria. Iraq is more or less, as you know already, under the control of the pro-Iranian forces, minus independent politicians, minus the fact that the government is telling us, look, we are with you. We like your contractors. <laughs> So if they like our contractors, it does not mean really that you know, they're pro-American. They like the contractors. So you have elements in the governments that are OK, but you have more than half of the government and the large segments of the parliament that are pro-Iranians. And they control the country in coordination with Iran. The Kurds in the north tried their bet for an independent Kurdistan, you remember, a couple years ago. Uh, it did not work well because the pro-Iranian militias surrounded them and stopped them. So the most reliable allies that we have in Iraq, Kurdish forces in the north, are somewhat surrounded. But they are pro-American, pro-Western. They'll be with us. Syria. Syria, I have already described what the challenge is. East of Syria is controlled by the Kurds. We are there. We we used them or we worked with them to defeat ISIS. ISIS is technically defeated, I agree. Geographically, ISIS doesn't have a sovereign entity anymore. But ISIS is funging into, is being transformed into cells underground. So the feature of an underground is when the upper ground <laughs> opens up, they're going to come back. Easy. You don't need a political scientist for this. this is, you know, Gangsters <laughs> would make the same analysis. So when you push them underground and you don't resolve the ideological problem, they're going to be three generations to go up. And then, of course, you have the Assad regime, which is more or less in control of Western Syria. But it is in control of Western Syria, Damascus, and other cities, precisely because the Iranians are in Syria. Now, who would that affect if the Iranians are in Syria? Hezbollah. Hezbollah out of Lebanon is the, living this golden age, happiest moments, because they leave Lebanon, go to Syria, connect with the Iranians. And the Iranians now, regime, have this highway from Tehran to Baghdad to Syria, Assad, to Beirut, Lebanon. They are at the maximum expansion. What would they bring with this maximum expansion? Missiles. So they are, they are basically establishing the missile or missiles base in Syria. Who would that unnerve? Israel. Yeah. So you don't need me, right? You know the whole thing. So the Israelis now are strategically nervous about the number of missiles established in Syria. That is problematic, because if we withdraw from eastern Syria, not only the Kurds will suffer, but there will be the, this what I call this automatic movement by the Iranians to fill the <coughs> void, strategically speaking, and the Israelis will be you know, face to face with them. That is not good news, because that would be war. Lebanon, it will be the easiest thing since, 19, since 2008. 
is practically under the influence or the domination of Hezbollah. That will be the shortest of all, uh, of all matters. Now, since time is pressing us, how many minutes? OK. Half an hour. Half an hour. No, but I want questions and answers as well. 15 minutes. 15 minutes? No way. We need 20 minutes for, for Rome, the people of Rome. Um, so the, the Trump administration's major moves, which I have supported, but I think we need to build more and faster, have been the following. In May of 2017, President Trump went to Riyadh, and he addressed 50 Arab and Muslim leaders. This is something now I can reveal I have been pushing for, I don't want to adopt, from the time of the campaign. We need to have an Arab coalition. We cannot operate by ourselves all the time everywhere. That's why in Europe we have NATO, although we're going to debate NATO, you have debated NATO, but still it's better than no NATO, than 27 countries doing whatever they want. In the region, it is crucial in my view to have a regional organization that would help us in multiple things, conducting the war on the jihadi organization. We can't do it ourselves all the time. Number two, more important, giving us the legitimacy, the Islamic legitimacy, to delegitimize the jihadi ideology. Many people do not believe in it. I think it's still a must. We need to have that push. And thirdly, on the ground, we need to have contingent. We need to have forces who will fill the void. Because every region we intend to leave is not ready. There is no readiness. So he met them. They issued excellent statements. One is to form the coalition on paper. The other one was to, do, to establish a counter-terrorism uh, ter and extremism center, which is operational, but we don't hear about it too much. And so it, it launched something, and then it stopped. Now, I want to be honest with ourselves. It stopped because we were busy in Washington for the last two years. Right. You know with what? With all these debates and all these congressional stuff, under Republican, under Democrat now, it paralyzed, in my view, in my humble view, it paralyzed the speed with which we should have gone over the past year and a half, at least. It is only now that we are kind of standing up and trying to move forward. But we're gonna, we have little time. That's why your assignment, 2020, we only have six, seven months of 2019. And then you know what's going to happen in 2020? Election year. That's a different. Uh, <laughs> then gonna have, you're going to have four years, but we don't know what the opposition will do. Basically, that was one move. The second move was, in my humble view, the withdrawal from the Iranian nuclear deal. Now, I am very close to our European friends. I had one of the, or co-head, co-chair, one of the organizations of MEPs between Europe and Congress. And I know that across the Atlantic, we are divided. The Europeans believe, most of the Europeans believe, that the Iranian nuclear deal was a good deal, <laughs> that it froze the buildup of a nuclear weapon. It allowed the companies to go to Iran and then have business. All of that I agree with. It's wonderful. But there is, some, there is a black hole that has not been addressed. The nuclear material was frozen, but something else was not frozen, which is the acquisition of long-range missiles. You don't purchase, deploy, acquire, improve ballistic missiles if you don't have the intention of using non-conventional weapons. Do, do we throw roses with the missiles? <laughs> it's not for roses on Valentine's Day. It's missiles that are prepared, like a forest of missiles, for the opportunity to be able, years from now, to acquire the nuclear uh, device, and then the missiles will be ready. The Iranians bought the most impressive anti-aircraft missile system. Why would you do that? Because you are expecting a strike against you. And why are you expecting a strike? Because you know that at one point, you're going to be aiming those missiles, you're going to weaponizing those missiles, and the air forces in the region and beyond are going to come to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know the Iranian strategic mind. It's very patient. So our friends, the Europeans, have a different view, except that on missiles, they are with us. They are with the US on the issue of missiles. But on the issue of withdrawal from the agreement, they're not. So we have that divide. 
withdrawing from the agreement, from the nuclear agreement, by the Trump administration did not mean that we don't want any agreement. We, we actually want an agreement on, on nuclear anything. Remember that South Africa and Ukraine, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they rushed to the United Nations. I remember that vividly. And they said, please come and help us. We're going to get rid of those nuclear weapons that we inherited from the previous regimes. In the case of Iran, basically, the projection I have is that this government in Iran may not be there forever. So the idea of having all the agreements with the Iranian, yes, but calm down. Let's see who is in charge, what the social uh, transformations in Iran are going to be. I believe that the average age today in Iran between, let's say, 24 and below, maximum, uh, I would say, maximum 26 and below, are not with that regime. You see the demonstrations, the protests, the minorities, Kurds, Arabs. So, I would have recommended an engagement with the civil society of Iran. Yeah. That's the agent that's gonna change mm -hmm. matters. Look at Eastern Europe, it was not long ago. While we were building those missiles with the Russians you know, to face the Soviets, it was Lech Walesa, Baklav Havel, the dissidents in Russia, they provoked basically the collapse of the Soviet Union and of course an economic mis mismanagement by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. All right, so now we have those two important decisions that were made by the administration. Uh, engaging with an Arab coalition and withdrawing from the Iran uh, deal plus putting sanctions. The question is, what is the strategy beyond that? We withdrew from the agreement, okay? So what is it that we're gonna do next? And here I'm gonna be a little bit critical because putting sanctions is the right thing to do, but to obtain a specific goal. You don't put sanctions uh, ex cathedra, you know, in general and that's it. You need to make sure that you are engaging with civil society so that civil society under these sanctions are gonna put pressure on the government of Iran to change course. Change course or change address, <laughs> you know, one or the other. That's how change has been the case in many countries, including in Eastern Europe. Um, with regard to the Arab coalition, I think the Arab coalition got into trouble when it divided between Qatar and Saudi and uh, the UAE and others. Uh, I think the Arab coalition engaged in, in, in Yemen where at the time where we were not ready, we in America were not ready for that. I am not sure now uh, how to get a solution for Yemen and how to get a solution for the divide in the Gulf, but I am pretty sure that if in America we have a unity, a solid unity, a political unity on foreign policy, which we don't have right now. I think we could make we, we could prompt a change in Iran. It's possible. I think we could help a solution in Yemen by basically disarming the militias. That's how a solution is. You know, you can't have a solution with militias roaming the cities. Same is the case in uh, in Libya. So we could have, we have the possibility of putting strength, putting pressure, moving forward if we are united in Washington in the next, let's say, year and a half. So if the challenge is, are we gonna be successful between now and 2020? We are in April. We still have really few months before December. So the bulk of what we can do is going to be in the next six to seven months. It does not mean that after the elections, we won't have the ability to move forward, and I agree, we'll, you know, whomever is gonna be in charge, I hope my candidate will be in charge, uh, have four years. <coughs> but if the question is between now and 2020, I would say there are matters we could, we could improve, there are policies we could apply very quickly, but um, I would look at those six to seven months as very challenging in terms of being able to achieve all the goals that the administration and a majority of Americans really would like to see happening. Um, I want to stop here. If you have any question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you so much. My name is Wadi Elisha. Uh, I'm from Egyptian. So my question is about Egypt and what's going on now in Egypt uh, with Mr. Sisi is promoting a uh, uh, change in the constitution to give himself for authorities. What do you think? I just want to know your opinion about what's going on in Egypt, especially with uh, from my perspective, uh, failure, uh, failure of the revolution in Egypt can be very dangerous for the future of uh, Egypt and the Middle East. Thank you for that. Um, Egypt is very dear to me. I've 
traveled there several times. I've traveled before the changes, during the changes, and after the changes. You mentioned you are from the Coptic community. I advised Coptic associations for the last 25 years, as you know. Um, I've engaged with many members of the Egyptian parliament, this one, the one before, met briefly with President Sisi, with many members of their government here and there. So when I address Egypt, uh, there is, of course, the emotional attachment, but I'll put it on the side and I look objectively. So what would have been the worst for Egypt, in my view, could disagree, would have been an Ikhwan, Muslim Brotherhood controlled Egypt, period. You know, from Abdel Nasser, who was our foe, to Sadat, who opened the, you know, the gates of peacemaking with Israel, mm -hmm. to everybody, including Mubarak, who stayed there for 6,000 years, I mean, for <laughs> <laughs> 32 years. You know, to the current Sisi government, if you, if you give me all of that, I would say the only period that I was concerned about, really, is a Ikhwan Muslim Brotherhood controlled Egypt because it would transform Egypt. And it did. In a few months, Egypt was becoming an Afghanistan into a God knows what. So thank, I don't want to say thank God, he doesn't meddle in politics, as you know, but thank the people of Egypt. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this demonstration of June the, th the 30th, you knew. Guys, 32 million people. That's BBC, that's not Fox News. BBC, <laughs> yeah, because they attack Fox News. Anything it says, we're attacked, we are attacked. BBC, mainstream, said 32 million people demonstrated in the streets of Cairo and other cities. People who are normal people, workers, fellahin, you know, uh, farmers, students, artists, everybody. 32 million people, that's the largest group of humans who walked together on the face of Earth for, since uh, Adam and Eve. So it was impressive to see that when civil society has the ability to rise against this kind of threat, no matter what happened immediately after, because immediately after, you're not yet in Sweden. You're not yet in you know, any of these democratic places. It's going to take time. I also praise those courageous journalists in Egypt who accompanied the demonstration, because the demonstrators without a voice from, mm -hmm. from you know, TV or radio wouldn't have had mm. this ability to demonstrate. And I will say it very clearly. I will praise the position of the army of Egypt, which protected them. The Obama administration and you know, the entire supporter system of, of the administration said this is a coup. A coup doesn't happen like that. A coup would go with tanks, without people, grab the president or the leader, and establish a military government. That's a coup. What happened was a revolution which was protected by the army. But let's be very honest. It's going to take time for Egypt to produce, after one, two, three, four elections, a lot of efforts, a fully liberal, democratic, multi-party, sophisticated system, and look what we have done. We formed that thing, and we are still not very at ease with it. So I agree with you that there are many things in Egypt that we are very attentive to, to make Egypt perfect, or quasi-perfect. But where, we, where the Egyptians are coming from, really, it was literally at the edge of a cliff, going into a caliphate-like uh, place. So that would be my humble opinion with regard to Egypt. The lady. My question is, are you currently advising President Trump? And if you aren't, who are his current foreign, uh, foreign advisors? I am currently formally not advising the administration because I'm outside the administration. But I'm sure he reads my tweets. <laughs> but who are his current? Obviously, he has, uh, he has the national security advisor, our good friend John Bolton. And he has many advisors, including uh, Secretary Paul, uh, Pompeo. And he has many other advisors. Some are inside the government. Some are outside the government. I think the president is surrounded many advisors. And I share a lot of my strategic views with the two I've named. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that we have Bolton and Pompeo in government. Happier than, I don't want to say than others, but than previous views that existed in the cabinet. Yeah, thank you, but I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the role of Russia in, um, in the former Syria. 
Um, and, and especially, why on earth does it seem the Russians are going to give up their base at Latakia to the Iranians? Hmm. Now you are teaching me something I didn't know, since your background has been in very important agencies. Okay. Uh, I agree with you, Russia's role in Syria, specifically since 2015, has completely changed. Before 2015, did I say 16? 15. Before 2015, Russia wanted to maintain its basis and was even in negotiation with this, the previous administration as to how we're going to coexist in, in Syria. But as of 2015, it looks like the Putin leadership wanted to do two things. Number one, grow their military presence, because that's the only coast they have. They have 200 kilometers of coast in the entire Mediterranean. You mentioned Libya. Yes, they would be interested in getting another 300 miles in Libya. That's how superpowers you know, operate. So far, they have Syria. Now, what the Putin leadership has done was to consolidate what they have. They have now strategic weaponry system that exists in Banyas and Tartus and elsewhere. And they want something else which was not there before. They want the Assad regime to be able to recapture all of Syria, to connect with all of Iraq, and to connect with Iran and Iran connects with Russia through the Caspian Sea. The Russian long-range uh, bombers or planes, they don't come through the Mediterranean. They actually fly over the Caspian, Iraq, Syria, and onto, well, into the Mediterranean. So the ambition of Moscow since 2015 are different now. They, they, they believe that we're not going to last too long in eastern Syria, that eventually we're going to withdraw from Syria, that we're going to withdraw from Iraq, and they're going to have this space going from the Mediterranean into Iran. That pleases the Iranians. It, it's, 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 you know, uh, it's the same space. Iran's long-term goal, as you know better than everybody here, is to project itself all the way to the Mediterranean. I wrote about it and briefed Congress since 2005. So Iran now has a control over Iraq, over part of Syria, and of course, poor Lebanon, Hezbollah. So Iran and Syria, uh, sorry, Iran and Russia have shared uh, strategic uh, goals in the region. Do you believe that the, the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict is replaced by the Arab-Iranian conflict? And another point is that Egypt was drawn from the Arabic NATO. This is, uh... Okay, two questions. I'm going to summarize quickly uh, because I know Atif from before. Yes, I did not spend a lot of time on the Arab-Israeli conflict on purpose, no, because there are so many other matters that we need to address. And the Arab-Israeli conflict is the most well-known conflict yeah. in America. Every neighborhood knows the names of every city in Israel and <laughs> or if they are Arabs, every uh, concentration of uh, demographies of Arabs. But let me say it clearly. I think that the Arab-Israeli, I wouldn't call it Arab-Israeli, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict has been static since Madrid conference, since 1992. Nothing has really happened after that. They agreed on concessions to each other. Egypt signed a peace treaty before that. Jordan signed a peace treaty after that. Even the PLO signed a peace treaty. And then nothing has really moved since 1992. Meanwhile, all the other volcanoes exploded, everything else. So if you are in Aleppo and you ask Arab, Syrian, Sunnis, what is your priority in life today? The liberation of Palestine? I said, no, oh, I want to bring down the Assad regime. I want to bring down the jihad. So each one of these conflicts stole away from the Palestinian-Israeli conflict the center of energies. If you are in Yemen, what would be your priority in Yemen? Stop the, 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 you know, the pro-Iranian militias, stop the South so on and so forth. So by itself, the Arab-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian conflict cause narrative which dominated the Middle East for many, many decades, by itself sort of crumbled into a one ethnic conflict. So what is the most discussed matter today in the Arab-Israeli conflict? It's the American, the White House project for a new Middle East, which we don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But that's, everybody's talking about it because that's the only hope for a possibility of a resolution. NATO, yeah. NATO, Arabic, NATO. Arabic NATO, I mentioned a little bit, I think Egypt, Saudi, UAE, Jordan, Bahrain, and others would like to form it. They Egypt need, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. yeah, yeah, I said, they want to form it. Egypt has different views. 
on the so-called NATO uh, agreement. Egypt think that the priority should be to focus on the jihadists and Al-Qaeda and ISIS and, and those. Saudi think that we need to they need to focus on Iran. So we have a NATO going in two different directions. And the UAE wants to focus on both. So that's the best I can uh, summarize with. Uh, yes, my name is Sobedi Dorian. And I have a question about Ilhan Omar's meeting with uh, Erdogan and uh, a lot of uh, stuff out there indicating that he believes at some point he would be the future of, the, well, the leader of the new caliphate. What is your take on that? And uh, is that something we should be suspicious of, this meeting that was sort of held behind closed doors, or is it simply one Muslim reaching out to another? Um, and, and also, the second question I have, uh, regarding the Europeans that, in my opinion, tend to, the European Union tends to run counter to everything the Trump administration believes in, whether it's pulling out of the climate accord, what have you, there are, there seems to be a surge of new independent, uh, I'll use the word conservative parties in Europe that are not necessarily drinking from the same tea as the European Union. Is there perhaps hope with those parties that we will see uh, a different outlook towards the Middle East? But the first question about the Caliphate is... You want the first question first? Yes. All right. <laughs> I'm not going to opine on our members of Congress if they are engaged in domestic matters, but since you mentioned a foreign policy matter, then yes, I will. Um, President Erdogan is not shy about his goals. He stated many times and clearly, and I'm surprised that the majority of Americans don't, un don't see it, don't understand it. I'm not surprised that Mr. Erdogan is making the statements, but it doesn't appear very clearly here, probably because of our media. Mm -hmm. President Erdogan and the AKP party are an Islamist party. They're not shy about it when they stated in Turkish. And the Turkish opposition, which by the way won municipal elections in Istanbul and in Ankara, which is today we are different than a week ago, has been very vocal about these matters. So Turkey has a very solid secular, quasi-liberal, pluralist force, which is not over, which is not done, despite the 12 years of AKP rule, and it was demonstrated. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to take over government soon, but it means that Turkey has two forces. The one in charge is an Islamist force. And its foreign policy is to connect with other Islamist forces, including with Qatar, and including before that with the Brotherhood in Egypt. And now they are backing a faction in Tripoli, which is close to the Muslim Brotherhood. Am I adding anything that you don't know or not available? It's there. The question that is more delicate is the relationship between our politicians and, and that ensemble of Islamist forces. I'm not surprised because many public figures, intellectual figures, academic figures, and NGO figures in the United States are also supporters of the Islamists' movements. Is this a secret uh, faith? Has been there since the 90s. So the fact that there are visits, I mean, if if American intellectuals and academics visited Iran, if some of our prominent politicians visited Assad, and if uh, I think a, one of the most prominent uh, leaders of one of our agencies said Hezbollah has moderate and has non-moderate, I don't want to name him, uh, I'm not surprised that many of our politicians are in touch with what I uh, consider Islamist movements or regimes or radicals. Not, not surprised. I have a tired arm. Mm -hmm. We raise again and again. But uh, let me just bring up two issues. One is uh, the annexation of the Golan Heights and its much broader implication on the water regions, whether it's uh, Sudan and Egypt or uh, uh, Libya. So, would you touch upon that? And, uh, may I ask you to repeat that question? I don't understand the second question, if you may repeat. Uh, the importance of water. Water, okay. Thank you for these three questions. I'm going to go as fast as possible. 
the annexation by Israel of the Golan Heights, actually I would formulate it differently. The annexation was done decades ago. It's the US recognition, US administration recognition of that part of the Golan Heights, by the way, not the entire Golan Heights. You know that actually 70% of the Golan Heights are still technically in the hands of the Syrian regime, maybe protected by the UN in some places, but people tend to forget about that. It's the band of territory that was acquired by Israel through two wars uh, that has been annexated by the Israelis and recognized by the US government, that is our president, our administration, as part of Israeli sovereignty. If you are asking me about that, I will say, this was a commitment by the Trump campaign. It became a commitment by the Trump administration, first for Jerusalem and second for the Golan Heights. Now, I'm at the beginning where you did not mention was Jerusalem. And then I'll come to the Golan Heights. Jerusalem, yes, it created a sandstorm. All the Arabs, including our friends and allies, including many of my friends, told me why would the Trump administration Recognize, move the embassy to Jerusalem, recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, even before we formed this Arab uh, alliance, and then we could negotiate with them. I, at some point, agreed with the vision that it's, it would have been better to create that alliance to push against Iran, push against the Ikhwan, and then come back and resolve that matter. It looks like the president has a different view. His view, he, remember, he's a real estate strategist. He thinks in terms of land swap and all what comes with it as an agreement based on which he could uh, try to resolve the problem. So he made the statements of, I'm moving my embassy to Jerusalem. In that statement, there was a mini statement that I understood. And I hope that many among my friends and colleagues would understand. He said, however, the borders of Jerusalem are still up for negotiations. What he meant for, by that is that there is a project within the project that the Palestinians should be encouraged by the Arabs first to accept what, what, they, what we call a transitional capital, which could be Abu Dis, which is a, uh, a suburb of Jerusalem, which has a full Arab majority. And then the Israelis will make the concession on the Arab neighborhoods of Jerusalem to be part of that Abu Dis, some sort of lawyer's strategy. Uh, so therefore, at the end of the day, though we moved our embassy to Jerusalem, part of Jerusalem will become part of a theoretical Palestinian state to be. So that would be my only note I'll, I would like to make, uh, meaning the, the file is not closed on negotiating with the, with the other side. Now, the two other questions are long. I've answered the one on President Sisi. And uh, with regard, uh, I believe, water. Water is the only question I won't be able to answer if I'm told that I have only five minutes because water <laughs> is about 6,000 years old problem. And I'm coming from a small country where the only problem is not water. <laughs> Lebanon has six rivers, it has snow, it could, you know, it, could give, it could give the entire region water and snow. But I can agree with you on one thing, water crisis in the Middle East is going to be with us for a long period of time, and you understand my conclusion. Okay. The great faith. Wally. Yes. Uh, my question is about Libya and General Haftar. Um, I have a copy of a video with General Haftar in it where he is holding the leaked minutes from a meeting in Sudan of hmm. Bashir and his cabinet talking about we will never allow Haftar to become the president of Libya, and he's freaking out and holding it. So with that background, do you think that the reason why the United States has stayed away from Haftar is because of our attempts to normalize relations with Sudan? It's a long shot, but it's still a shot that our foreign policy establishment, basically, uh, whatever the Trump administration was clear intense, it worked. Recognition of, the, of Jerusalem as a capital, you know, you have to recognize it, and it was recognized. Uh, backing, let's say, an action of the US Army in eastern Syria, they did. Everything else is up for grabs. That's why I mentioned the past two years were difficult, because the administration was under pressure for a million things that you know what it is. It had few points in foreign policy it followed thoroughly. Everything else, I don't think there was a Trump policy on everything. 
like on Sudan. I wouldn't imagine that we would be with Bashir in Sudan, and he is a perpetrator of a genocide according to the ICC. Yet we lifted the sanctions, and you were screaming about it for many, many months. So let's see what happened now. On Haftar, we're not clear. On many other matters, we're not clear. This non-clarity is not about the fact that we are against or with. We're busy with, with other matters. So really, activists and citizens who are very intense about matters should make their opinion known, known in Congress and with the administration. I see the microphone. <laughs> yes. Not only to thank you, Waleed, but to um, take the privilege of the chair in asking you a, a short question, yeah. which will only require another 20 minutes. <laughs> that we don't have. But you, you, you didn't uh, mention the issue of the repercussions of uh, Turkey's determination repeated today to buy the Russian S-400. Uh, yeah, missile defense system, the repercussions for NATO and the Middle East regarding that, if you would be so kind. Of course. The fact that I did not mention many things is just one hour, 30 minutes. <laughs> That's why... an extra two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> the Erdogan government is now sort of cornered in the region. The United States is not supporting all the policies of the Erdogan government, right? They want to go in Syria, they want to disarm the Kurds, they wanted to bring down Assad. We were not for these matters. So Erdogan limited its goals in Syria. And of course, at the same time, Erdogan established this understanding with Putin. Because of the incident, if you recall, there was an incident between Turkey and Russia, and Russia plumbed down on Turkey with everything it got. And that's a reminder of what we've done when we had the pastor detained in Turkey. Trump, with tweets, said, you know, I'm putting two of your ministers uh, as designated, uh, you know, uh, breachers of law. So his position is very difficult because he's dealing with two superpowers. He decided that the, I am a member of NATO anyway, you know, so anything I want from the US and NATO, I'm gonna get at the end of the day. But Russia is very serious as a neighbor. So he struck a deal with Putin, and that deal was about getting the weapons he's not, he's not getting from us, creating a balance of power in the region, trying to get an agreement in northern Syria so that he can maintain his own influence inside Turkey. Because what he has promised his public is basically uh, Turkey is going to be tough, Turkey is going to be influential in the neighborhood. On the other hand, his economy is not doing that well inside Turkey. So now that the opposition, I'm gonna link it to that point and finish, now that the opposition understood the weakness of Turkey's foreign policy, I would say the limitation, they are rising. So he's gonna get more challenges, I believe, from his opposition. Thank you very much. Thank you.